I'm Keith Armitage. I'm Lisa Arfons, and the title of our talk is the new ACGME Next Accreditation System, Alphabet Soup. Okay. The ACGME is uh, re-engineering their accreditation approach, going from process and details to outcomes. So our presentation really is on the history of the ACGME accreditation approach and really focusing on new milestones. And new evaluation system for our, our residency. Thank you for joining us for this week's Grand Rounds. It's a privilege to introduce today's two speakers. Dr. Lisa Arfons is an assistant professor in the hematology oncology section of the Cleveland VA Medical Center and is associate program director for the University Hospital's Case Medical Center Internal Medicine Residency. She completed her undergraduate training at John Carroll University followed by medical school at Case Western Reserve University, graduating in the AOA Honor Society. She then became a resident at University Hospital's Case Medical Center, winning the prestigious Willard Birnbaum Intern of the Year Award, before completing her chief residency, as well as hematology oncology fellowship here. She joined the faculty in 2010. She holds board certifications in internal medicine, hematology and oncology, has authored a number of research articles in her young career, and was the 2012 recipient of the Lewis Stokes VA Medical Center Subspecialist of the Year Award. She is one of our house staff's favorite faculty members and most inspiring mentors. Dr. Keith Armitage is a professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases and is Vice Chair for Education and Residency Director in the Department of Internal Medicine. His primary professional focus has been on postgraduate medical education and clinical infectious diseases. He received an undergraduate degree from the University of Kansas and attended medical school at the University of Colorado. He completed his internal medicine residency and infectious diseases fellowship at University Hospitals, after which he served as chief resident and joined the faculty in 1992 to begin his now 21-year tenure as residency program director. He is the past president of the Association of Program Directors in Internal Medicine and is 2002 recipient of the Parker J. Palmer Courage to Teach Award from the ACGME. He has authored numerous research articles and book chapters and has been the recipient of countless teaching awards. He has been best described as a gentleman who artfully intertwines his passion for medicine with his love for sculpting the careers of future physicians. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lisa Arfons and Dr. Keith Armitage. So, um, yeah, I became program director the first day I joined the faculty, and that was an immediate ACGME violation because uh, you're supposed to have been on the faculty for five years. So, <laughs> but that's a violation that goes away with time because when they came back another time, I was still here, and five years had elapsed. So, um, well, thanks for that uh, kind introduction, Crystal. Um, so uh, this is our, our conflict slide. Neither Lisa or I have any financial conflicts other than our job depends upon the ACGME. So uh, our objectives today is to give a brief historical overview of the ACGME, to talk about the uh, ACGME Next Accreditation System, which they refer to as NAS, uh, which started just a few months ago. Lisa's going to do sort of a deep dive into the new language of GME, talking about milestones, quirky milestones, and EPAs. It's only taken us about two years to sort of get our minds around this. I'm sure in, in half an hour it'll be clear. Um, and then we'll, then we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, some of our new approaches based upon this new system. Um, so it seems like the ACGME has been around forever, but it was only found in 1981. And ACGME is sort of the, the governing body that credits all GME programs. Uh, uh, allopathic GME programs. It's private, not-for-profit uh, council credits more than 9,000 uh, residencies, 135 specialties. There's uh, 116,000 uh, trainees in ACGME approved programs. And the ACGME has tremendous leverage because obviously board certification often requires um, success, successful completion of training in an ACGME program. And there's a significant funds flow from Medicare and other sources associated with GME training programs, and that fund, funds flow depends upon ACGME accreditation. So they can sort of do what they want. They have they have um, unbelievable leverage. Um, so their mission is to improve healthcare by as assessing and advancing the quality of resident physicians' education through exemplary 
accreditation. I'm sure they got. I'm sure they worked for months on that mission statement, and it's a it's a fantastic one. Um, their uh, their member organizations include the American Board of Medical Specialties, the uh, AHA, the AMA, the Association of Medical Colleges, and the Council of Medical Specialty Societies. And each of those groups appoints members to the AMA board. They also have public members. Um, the uh, the uh, the ACGME uh, board creates and, and, and the staff create what's called the common program requirements. Then each discipline, uh, that uh, you know, each, each training discipline, uh, has what's called a residency review committee. And the residency re review committee uh, determines the training requirements for that discipline. And the, the Internal Medicine Residency Review Committee um, is made up of us. So it's, it's, it's uh, appointed by various medicine organizations and it's medicine faculty. Um, so see, I, I'm old enough to remember Pogo from a kid. This is probably our kid. So we met the enemy and, and he is us. So, um, so the, sort of the history of accreditation is that, um, that in the last 20 years, uh, the, the ACGME and the RRCs piled on more and more requirements and, and detail requirements. So the picture on your right is the entire requirements for internal medicine training in, uh, in the 1970s, the precursor to the ACGME. So they had it all on one page. And then over the next 20 years, they became more, more proscriptive, adding requirements for this, requirements for that, requirements for this. Um, and they call these shoulds or musts. So you must have this and you should do this. And in the medicine RC said a should is a must, so I guess they're all must for us. And what this means was that the accreditation process really relied on, on uh, you know, reading the requirements and, and you know, doing, having so many clinics, having a lecture on this, having a clinic in that, um, and it became all about process. And the whole accreditation uh, approach was, as I say, counting widgets. That that uh, that the the, the there would be a site visit, and and they would just look at all the details of everything you did, uh, and it became very, very process oriented and cumbersome. Um, and uh, the way that the ACGB accredited programs was to come visit your program every few years. And it was sort of like an IRS audit, you sort of got everything lined up, and, and they, they gave you uh, a, an accreditation period anywhere from zero years, which was of course disaster to five years. So five years was, was the most you can get. So your goal as a program director is to get five years so they wouldn't be back in for five years and, uh, and you know, have everything lined up. Um, and sort of everything focused around cycle length and, and these sort of detailed site visits. Um, the, uh, in, in 1999, the ACGME introduced um, the six general competencies. Um, the picture on your right is David Leach. David Leach was the executive director of the ACGME for a decade, and he really is the individual who championed the, the concept of competencies. David Leach was from Henry Ford in Detroit. He was the uh, education director for Henry Ford, and believe it or not, in the 1990s, Henry Ford was a Case Western Associated Hospital. So the Cleveland Clinic was associated with Ohio State, and Henry, you know, anyway. So uh, David was down here quite a bit, um, and he's sort of an eccentric character, but he, and a visionary, but he, he got the job of the executive director and, and he said we need to shake up medical education. So he came up with the six general competencies and, you know, for the last decade it's been the job of the program directors to make sure the faculty at least had heard of the competencies. So if a site visitor came and stopped a random faculty member and said, have you heard of the six competencies, they would say yes. Um, that's how I spent the last ten years, Rick. Uh, um, <laughs> And, um, and the, the competencies, again, you know, patient care, medical knowledge, interpersonal communication, professionalism, practice-based learning improvement, system-based practice, they, they really um, uh, sort of uh, became uh, uh, part of what we did in terms of our assessment tools. So evaluations had to be based upon the competencies. Learning objectives had to be based upon the competencies. And, and the idea of having this sort of competency-based system for assessing competence um, was embraced by undergraduate medical education and by MOCs, MOC maintenance of certification. Uh, and so, for instance, medical schools adopted this. So Case Western um, has in their mission statement in the School of Medicine that, um, that mastery of nine competencies is required for promotion graduation. 
And so uh, they adopted the six ACGME competencies, and then they added three more um, to be overachievers, but lifelong learning and professional development, research and scholarship, and civic professionalism, health advocacy, and leadership. Um, and, and there's this sort of concept that these competencies would start the first year of medical school, and there'd be this continuum through, through residency training, and then in maintenance of certification, um, and people you know, embraced this approach. Um, and then along came um, the next executive director, who is keeping the concept of competencies, but looking more at, um, at, at outcomes approach to accrediting training programs and introducing the concept of milestones, which Lisa is going to talk about uh, quite a bit. Um, and on your right is a picture of the current executive director of the ACGB, Tom Naska. Tom, Tom was the uh, residency director at Jefferson, became the chair at Jefferson, and then dean at Jefferson all in about four years. So it was more than four years. But, uh, and then... Um, and then became executive director of the ACU Jimmy. I think under his leadership, uh, he's pushing out sort of a new approach to accreditation and the milestones. And we're going to talk about um, the next accreditation system. Um, and I wanted to mention three other things that, that Tom is doing that are sort of interesting with the ACU Jimmy. The ACU Jimmy is now accrediting international programs. So um, they, I think the first program they accredited was in Singapore, and they're, and, and they're reaching out. So any program in the world, if they meet the requirements, can become ACGME accredited. Um, the ACGME uh, attempted to consolidate the governance of training programs with the osteopathic community. And this, was, this whole thing was relatively amusing. Um, the the ACGME and the AOA negotiated for 18 months, and they had memorandums of understandings with the two boards, so they both been under the same umbrella. And then it all fell apart at the last minute, and there's sort of acrimonious uh, letters to, to each other. And so currently there is no, um, there is no effort to consolidate uh, osteopathic and allopathic uh, GME uh, governance. Um, and then the most controversial thing, or, uh, that's the latest to come out, is that the ACGME is now proposing um, that any advanced training, you know, any fellowship or sub, you know, some specialty training, requires prior residency training in an ACGME approved program. So currently, people can do internal medicine elsewhere and come be an ID fellow or an endocrine fellow. A lot of radiologists do this, they, they've trained elsewhere. Um, and what they're proposing is that only training in an ACGME approved program uh, or Canadian uh, approved program uh, will meet the requirements for uh, any advanced training. And, and this is very controversial and uh, getting a lot of comment. Um, so let me turn back to, the, to what's called the, the NAS, Next Accreditation System. The, the big concept of the Next Accreditation System is to look at outcomes over process. So as I said in the beginning, the ACGME became very process oriented, counting widgets, you know, dotting I's, so many of this, so many of this, and never looked at the quality of training programs or what we did. So the, the idea is very attractive of saying, instead of looking at process, let's look at how training programs are doing training their residents, figure out how to measure what they're doing, and then focus less on the details and focus more on the outcomes. So it's a, it's a very attractive concept that, that um, instead of counting widgets, we'll, we'll look at the finished products and, 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 and how, you know, how programs are doing. So um, under the NAS, there's no more three to five year high stake site visits. Um, um, and, and they're even sort of coming up with this approach saying that there's some core requirements that you absolutely must follow, but then other requirements are so-called details. So if you don't have you know, so many of this, or if um, the residents in continuity clinic don't see enough gender mix, that's okay as long as your program is meeting um, the, the outcomes. And the, the way they're trying to measure the outcomes of the success of training programs is by having training programs report on what they're calling milestones, and Lucy's going to talk about this in detail, about how you know, residents achieve competence in these milestones. So um, each discipline um, has to come up with their own reporting milestones, and then um, every six months the program has to report directly to the ACGME on how each trainee um, uh, is doing in achieving these milestones. And what they, they're, they're suggesting that Every six months, each program spends 30 to 60 minutes discussing each trainee, which um, is not going to happen. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> um, the other elements of NAS include uh, an annual resident survey, an annual faculty survey, which we'll be doing for a couple of years, an annual update during the web, 
And instead of visiting training programs every three to five years, they're now going to visit hospitals every couple of years. And they call these clear visits, clinical learning and environmental review. Um, and the GME office is very nervous about this. They're expecting a clear visit. So uh, Dr. Netterhorst and Dr. Schock are you know, looking at this, looking at the rules, and, and, and preparing for uh, their, their clear visit. Um, the ACGB has not given up on the competencies, and at least we'll talk more about this. So the milestones are so organized by the competencies. So um, we have to use competency-based assessment tools that map the milestones. And uh, this is all very confusing, and Lisa's going to shed light, because she's done a deep dive. So go ahead. Thank you. So as Keith said, I'm going to um, take a little bit more granular approach to our discussion, and then hopefully show you how this is going to be used uh, in, in our day-to-day -day rotation evaluations. So the goals of the NAS, this was published by Tom Naska and, and his colleagues in the New England Journal of Medicine last year, is really to accelerate the ACGME's movement towards accreditation based on outcomes. As Keith said, it's really looking at the effectiveness of what we're doing rather than just how we're doing it. Um, to reduce the burden associated with the current structure, not counting so many widgets. Self-regulation, we recognize that this is still important uh, to our profession, and yet we understand that there are stakeholders, um, specifically the public, the patients, uh, you know, other, other uh, members of the community that have heightened expectations of physicians in this day and age and, and going forward, um, and we want to answer the call of that. So this is very program driven. Um, what the NAS has really allowed um, is innovation early on and it's it's innovation and the ability of programs themselves to decide what are appropriate assessment tools and evaluation methods based on their own um, educational goals um, and so we have to create data for milestone assessment and there has been a community of internal medicine educators that have done this for us to help uh, so we have the tools available out there within our community um, we're doing faculty development to assess competence this is what we're doing right now so we're taking care of this we have to document and we have to report um, we're documenting with new evaluations and then as Keith said too this does allow us then to innovate um, and then try new approaches and, and adjust our own evaluation and assessment tools for our program. Um, this sounds nice. It's very, very, very daunting. When we first started this, we felt like we didn't really have much direction at all. Um, luckily, thanks to mostly Keith, things are starting to come together and be a little more concrete. And uh, we actually see where this is going and how this can benefit us. But it was uh, very overwhelming to begin with. So what does this do for you as faculty and for you as the trainees? How does this really change your interactions and how are you going to be evaluating people? Um, rather than going from process now to competency-based and uh, evaluations, it's not just having the knowledge and testing the knowledge, but really being able to apply it in more complex um, situations. So it's, it's a higher level of competence and what we call competency than just you know, strict uh, verbatim knowledge of, of, of something. So it's going to be a richer, uh, more depth to a portfolio. We're going to be trying different assessment tools, hopefully. Um, we do have a very good um, assessment tool already, already doing multi-source feedback and training exams, meeting with your program directors, but hopefully that will become more of a portfolio. It's very authentic. Again, these need to be real-time, important outcomes to you in your daily practice, um, and the ACGME recognizes that. Um, direct observation. I feel that we do this a lot already, and this will definitely continue. And it should be more formative and not just summative, um, so it's, it's more low stakes. Um, you know, residents will have the opportunity to grow and improve um, throughout, and it's not just every six months you get this evaluation. It's really supposed to be more real-time, um, very good, useful feedback for you guys. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now go into some definitions about um, how we build the assessment and evaluation tools. And this is a common language that ACGME and then also the internal medicine community within ACGME is using um, for the assessment. So we're going to start very small with the curricular milestones. Let's see here. Um, and these are very specific abilities. And then these are built into entrustable professional activities. And then these are reporting milestones, which we'll talk about, go back to the ACGME, and then, as Keith said, make up just a portion of the next accreditation system. 
along with the faculty surveys, program surveys, and the CLIR. And um, also, just don't forget that all of this is still linked to and in using the six basic competencies as sort of a framework um, to, to bounce everything off of. So what are curricular milestones? So curricular milestones define the individual abilities. They're very specific, expected of trainees as they progress through training. And it's framed in behavioral terms, so it can be observed. Um, and it really does set the stage for the assessment of competence. And in 2007, as part of the Outcomes Redesign Project, the um, AIM, along with ABIM, ACGME, developed 142 curricular milestones. And those are divided among the six core competencies. If you guys have handouts, I don't know if <coughs> the handouts made it, um, the milestones are in there. And we will review, I'll bring them up also. So what's nice is that we have 142 milestones. I think they cut this down originally. I forget how many there were initially when they did the first draft. Do you remember, Keith? I don't remember. Yeah, there was a lot. But this was whittled down by the community to 142. We are not limited to just the 142. Um, and we can use as many or as little as we want. Some people are using none. Some people are using all of them. Um, and really, when you write your milestones, what you have to remember is that um, you know, the milestones demonstrate competence in the activity that define the profession. We're not interested as internal medicine residents and trainees if, if you can assess patients for post-operative care. You know, um, you're not taking out gallbladders. We're not going to assess you on that. So, um, It has to cover skills, knowledge, and attitude. It's very broad ranging to cover everything that, that makes up your profession. And really, again, it has to be very authentic. And do these things equate to the things that the public trusts that the physicians are doing and should be doing. So it has to be real and, and applicable. Um, so if you Google um, internal medicine milestones, you'll come up, these are the 142 milestones, and they're all organized within this, the six basic competencies. Uh, here's the first one, patient care, and they're labeled with these um, shortcut terms, just abbreviations that we use to map, which we'll talk about. Um, and if you read through these, some of them are very, very similar, and the differences are very subtle. I don't know how they whittle these down to 142. Um, but they're, they're pretty variable. So within patient care, acquire accurate and relevant history from the patient in an efficiently customized, prioritized, and hypothesis-driven fashion. Um, medical knowledge demonstrates sufficient knowledge to diagnose and treat undifferentiated and emergent conditions. Um, they want common ambulatory conditions, conditions requiring hospitalization, basic science, pathophysiology. So you really have to have a very good understanding along the trajectory of, of patient care. Practice-based learning and improvement. Respond welcomely and productively to feedback from all members of the healthcare team. So it's all about attitude as well. Um, including faculty, peer residents, students, nurses, allied health workers, and patients. Um, interpersonal communication skills, um, effectively use an interpreter to engage patients in the clinical setting, including patient education. Um, they really thought of a lot of things. Professionalism, um, document and report clinical information truthfully. I know there's something in here about doing your discharge, summaries on the day of discharge. Um, <laughs> Keith wrote that one specifically. Um, Systems-based practice, so recognizing health system forces that increase the risk for error, including barriers to optimal care. Um, so these are the 142 milestones. This is where we're starting. Again, um, we can use others. We don't have to just rely on, on these alone. Um, now I messed this up, sorry. So those are the milestones, and really those are very specific. They're um, abilities that then we can use to build entrustable professional activities. And so activities really constitute the specialty. They're, they're similar, when you really think about it, to the milestones. They're just bigger and a little more all-encompassing. Um, and again, it's that we all agreed should be carried out by a trained specialist. Again, you guys don't have to take gallbladders out. You're not performing ECT therapy. Um, EPAs together constitute really the core of our profession. Now, the thing about the EPAs, though, is that they also can be very program specific. We can write our own. 
Um, they can be as small or as little as we want them to be, and we'll talk about that. Entrustable is a made-up word. Um, it was actually developed and, and coined by a gentleman who is Dutch. Um, so it will help programs identify the critical activities that constitute our specialty. Um, it's acquired through training, leads to very recognized and measurable output, and is very observable. And again, it's always with the competencies. So as I've said, EPAs can be really anything that you want them to be. Um, Eric Worm's group out of Cincinnati has really spearheaded a lot of the efforts, at least in this region, and also they've given a lot of national talks um, on their method of, of developing milestones and EPAs. They started it probably about two years before we certainly did and before a lot of people in the community did, and so they have a really good sense of how they want their milestones and EPAs to look, and they've been sharing that with us. So. Um, what they gave as an example is a little rock that can be an EPA of interpreting an ECG, so a very, very defined, narrow um, EPA. A bit bigger rock would be um, managing ACS. And then the biggest rock would be resuscitating, stabilizing, and caring for critically ill patients. So again, you can really adjust the EPAs to your liking and what is important for your rotation, your program. Um, is it an inpatient acute care unit? Is it a longitudinal unit? such like a continuity clinic. Um, the largest EPAs, um, and I think you guys have a copy of those as well, are the 16 end of training EPAs that have been approved again by yet another subcommittee with AIM and the uh, ABIM. Um, they publish 16 end of training EPAs. We have used some of these. Again, they're very large um, and they are a little burdensome. Um, we may use them going forward as just that to kind of check the list off at the end of training, um, and but they're available for use. Another way that Eric Warm in his group described the EPAs is really is an antibody metaphor. So you have the content-based EPA or the variable portion, uh, and that can be very different for each rotation. So for unratinoff Weissman, management of neutropenic fever, management of chemotherapy complications, management of um, acute oncologic emergencies, that will be very specific. As opposed to process-based EPAs where you can take a complete history, do your discharge summary, do medical reconciliation, be nice to the patients, um, a little broader EPA. Some programs um, are developing several EPAs for each individual rotation. We're trending in that direction ourselves. Other programs that are much smaller, they don't have as much variability uh, as we do. They're using literally three evaluations, inpatient, outpatient, and consult. And that's all that they need for their, their program size and, and acuity. Um, so there's really three steps in mapping and developing an EPA and recognizing what assessment tools are best once you've determined what EPA uh, you want to use. And this is, these are two of the, the um, EPAs, the end of training EPAs. I just use this as an example. But the first step is to decide on the EPA and describe um, what that EPA actually entails. And so managing the care of patients with acute common diseases across multiple care settings, you can see the task requires obtaining accurate and complete information, knowledge of diseases, communicate the plans, and adapt the care plans to changing clinical information. What you then do is um, you use your list of 142 related curricular milestones, um, or you write your own, and you say, okay, well, I think that you know patient care A2 and A3 and B1 um, are all important with this. Um, in, in this EPA, so I want to use these. Um, I don't think that there is any that's important in professionalism for this particular EPA, so I'm not going to use any. This is very program specific. You can use as few or little um, curricular milestones that you want within an EPA. They don't, there's no rules at all. This is completely variable. We can choose anything. But if you look here, patient care A1 is acquire accurate and relevant history from the patient in an efficiently customized, prioritized, and hypothesis-driven fashion. So this links back to the EPA of managing care of patients with acute complex and or comorbid diseases. And then, finally, for the, the third step, for the assessment, um, you, know, you have to then decide, based on what you're asking uh, and what you're assessing, how are you going to measure it best to get a real, um, 
true and authentic evaluation. So multi-source feedback, which we are to do with our 360 evaluations, chart simulated recall, um, I don't know that we do this too much, maybe an outpatient clinic. Um, some people do this. This is you, know, you sitting down with a trainee as a teacher and going through a history and physical exam, a note, and, and really sort of breaking it down that way. Chart audits, obviously looking at um, discharge summaries, the quality of discharge summaries, this is important, looking at your H&Ps. When you um, review the resident's H&P when you're writing your own history and physical, that's a chart audit. Um, standardized patient, OSCE, we really don't have this in our program right now. And then the in-training exam will continue as well. So what had happened was, I mean, we appreciated the fact that we had curricular milestones and we had EPAs and they were very program specific, um, but this was great for individual programs. What this meant, though, for the ACGME and the RRC was that if they just took all the information as is, they would have had 9,000 programs and 135 specialties, giving them all of their own individual EPAs and curricular milestones. And there was no way then to measure everything and standardize everything. So what the ACGME and the RRC asked was that each specialty develop what we call reporting milestones. And in the old language, this sort of term narratives, when it was a little more hazy as to really what they, they were going to be. Um, but these were specialty-driven milestones, outcome reporting structure for the NAS. And so they said, look, you can do anything you want with the milestones, you can do anything you want with the EPAs, you have to, as the internal medicine specialty, adopt your, your reporting milestones and you have to report to us based on that. Every internal medicine program will do this. So um, yet another subcommittee that developed 22 reporting milestones. So it's curricular milestones, reporting milestones, and I think you have a copy of the reporting milestones as well. Um, and these are very important because it fills the gap for outcome-based assessment. This standardizes everything within our community, and it really is a framework for faculty development and training expectations. It's not just a widget. It's very helpful, actually, um, and we have to report in this format, as I've said. So this is the, the format that we have to report in, and there's 22 of these. I'm showing you the ACE competency, the sub-competency. Um, it works effectively within an interprofessional team, including peers, consultants, nursing, ancillary professionals and other support. And how it's really broken down is there's five uh, categories. The three in the middle, the first one is behaviors of an early learner. And so what is important to recognize in this is if you just imagine this on a scale of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, if you're a first month intern, you might only be a three. That's fine, all right? We know that you're all overachievers, but you're not going to be a nine the moment you walk in here, okay? Um, and this says frequently requires reminders from team to complete physician responsibilities. So this is your senior resident constantly asking you if you've called your consult and repleted your electrolytes. This is normal behavior for an early learner, okay? Once you've achieved all of these competencies and then some of the competencies here in this column, um, we check you off here, you're sort of right in the middle. This middle column here is advancing and demonstrating improvement in performance related to milestones. So you're progressing along nicely. We can see that there's some growth. By March of intern year, we're going to start seeing some changes. You know, second year, obviously, you're progressing along. This graduation target is ready for unsupervised practice, okay? At that point, you understand the roles and responsibilities, and, if, of, and you effectively partner with all members of the care team, and you actively engage in team meetings and decision-making conferences. Then there's this aspirational column that the ACGME again recognizes as part of maintenance of certification and ongoing professional growth that we don't expect this at, from our trainees the moment you're finished with residency. There's ongoing professional growth but this is available for programs to facilitate further professional development. Unfortunately, someone's always on the wrong end of the bell curve, and there is a column that's a critical deficiency that's not even, you know, there's this heavy line here, these three lines where it's not even considered, um, you know, on the, the right trajectory. So this is a very serious issue. Frustrates team members with inefficiency and errors, refuses to recognize the contributions of the other interprofessional team members. And so all of the 22 reporting milestones are broken down in this way. This is what we report on for every resident on all the 22 sub-competencies 
every six months. And so this is why they're recommending the 30, 30 to 60 minute discussions on each resident. Um, so right now we have built a lot of the curricular milestones into EPAs within the My Evaluation system. Keith is going to go over that. We really haven't started mapping to the, the sub-competencies yet. We're just trying to get the evaluations to roll out right now. Um, unfortunately, the ACGME is not linked with any one evaluation system, and so we're not really clear on how we're going to actually be submitting this information to the ACGME just yet, unless you know. Do you know? Um, so you can imagine um, there's a challenge here. So we have 120 residents, and every six months we have to report 22 milestones for each of the 120 residents. Um, and so what, what we've been working on, you know, feverishly off and on for the last six months is trying to come up with an evaluation system using the curriculum milestones to give us data to, to uh, inform these 22 milestones. So um, we've been creating evaluation forms that, that, um, that are used, the, the, so, and the language is confusing, curriculum milestones, EPAs, you know, uh, but we've been using uh, you know, a new approach to evaluation um, and, and I'll, I'll show uh, one of the forms in a second. Um, uh, and, then, uh, and then, as Lisa said, we, we've, we, we're doing this sort of using the, the granular mechanisms of myevaluation.com, and I think we're on the right track, but, but in the, the, once, we get, once we're done, and we're almost done, we have to map each evaluation to, to the 22 milestones. The idea is every six months we hit one button, we get a printout for each resident, and we can talk about it for five minutes and say, yeah, this is about right, and then not 30 to 60 minutes. So have a really robust and effective, uh, meaningful evaluation system to sort of uh, create these reports. Um, the, uh, so what does it mean for our training program? As Lisa said, it's a new evaluation system based upon competency assessment and uh, to provide data flow to milestone reporting. And uh, the approach we're using for every single evaluation now is using a, a competency scale. Um, remedial, gaining competence, competent, proficient, which means um, greater analytical, analytical awareness, able to teach, and an expert, intuitive, aspirational. Now, what's important for faculty is that um, you know someone is brand new to the training program and they're, and they're learning acute care in the wards, critical care, inventory care, it's appropriate to give them a two. And, uh, and if we report to the ACGME that all 120, of our, uh, all 120 of our residents are competent from day one, they'll come and visit us and say, hmm, this doesn't seem right, Dr. Armitage. So we have to report interns or are, are not haven't achieved all competencies instantly, all, all 22 milestones. Um, and I, you know, we, we, we've been rolling this out in block three and we, I've done, we've done uh, new peer evaluations based upon curricular milestones, EPAs, and this scale, and we've done faculty evaluations, and I, as the House staff know, most faculty know, I look at all these as they come in um, whenever I'm in a boring meeting, and I, and I go to lots of boring meetings, but uh, um, and I, what I notice in the House staff is everyone, everyone is giving each other fives, so everyone is saying that everyone's an expert, and I think the actually the faculty you know, we've only done a few faculty evaluations so far, but I think that they've been more honest. That you know, but new interns a lot of them have been you know gaining competence, and it's totally appropriate as a, you know an August, July, September intern to be gaining competence and get a two. So one of the things that's important for the house staff is that getting a two as an intern is normal and not bad. Because you know we have to have this this breakdown for, for reporting competence to the ACGME. Um, so the other thing, and I you know I, I, and specifically try to invite some of the some specialty coordinators and some specialty um, uh, uh, directors to, to, to this uh, session. So the ACGME rolled this out for medicine, orthopedics, dermatology, neurosurgery this year, and actually we were supposed to uh, report. Our first reporting period was supposed to be December, and the ACGME and, and, and the various uh, you know education communities realized that the, the work involved in figuring out an evaluation system and a reporting system was so great they put off their first reporting period until June. So we're you know we're still working out our system, um, but this is coming in July for all subspecialties. 
So every fellowship will now have have to have their own um, their own milestone system, and every every especially in internal medicine right now has a has a committee that is coming up with the 22 milestones. I know like Sahil Parikh is on the committee for interventional cardiology, and I know other faculty may be on the committees for their the disciplines. Um, I think that the milestones for internal medicine subspecialty training will probably be more granular and specific than the internal medicine milestones. Because again, we, we pass this out. We pass out the again, we pass out the 22 reporting milestones. We passed out the 142 curriculum milestones. And just to confuse everybody, we pass out the 16 EPAs, the alphabet soup. Um, I think, and if you look at the, the 22 reporting milestones from internal medicine, they're pretty broad and generic. So, I took a look at um, I took a look I took a look at neurosurgery and orthopedics because they're in this now. So th these are the uh, these are the like the orthopedic milestones: um, anterior crucial ligament patient care, ankle arthritis medical knowledge, ankle arthritis patient care. Look, um, so and then they had some more generic ones. So, um, so. They're very specific to sort of orthopedic practice, and that's what I, I think. When we see this, especially milestones, I think they'll be more specific for sort of subspecialty content competencies. They'll still have you know system thinking, interprofessional inter competency, that sort of thing. But um, you know, ninety percent of the orthopedic milestone language was on you know knees, ankles, hips, <laughs> elbows, shoulders. Anyway, tendons, ligaments, um, <laughs> but this is coming. So um, I think it, the training program has gone through the experience this year of trying to figure out the granular details. That is, coming up with an evaluation system that gets data that flows sort of automatically to these 22 reporting milestones. And all the, the various uh, residency training evaluation software vendors or you know, are, are, are they're trying to keep the business or all the training programs? So they're you know they're loading the 22 milestones, they're loading the 142 curriculum milestones, or, you know, and so we're 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 we've been making this work, um, and it, it it's been a it's been a, a fun project. Um, as as Lisa said, we've been writing our own curriculum milestones. So I, I did write one for doing discharge summaries in a timely fashion, and that'll be in a, a peer evaluation. And we did one for for verbal handoffs and, and, and that sort of thing. And it, it's been uh, it's been interesting. Um, <coughs> So what does this mean for faculty? I think that um, the faculty need to adjust to the new evaluation tools. Um, I think that um, that hopefully there will be a little more direct observation uh, from faculty or specific activities. So there's a uh, you know there's a, there's a uh, a competency of uh, you know giving bad news. So hopefully during an inpatient rotation or an outpatient rotation, a faculty member observes a resident you know, giving mad news to a patient or family, and then that's part of the evaluation. So direct observation is important. Uh, it's been a challenge for us um, to, uh, uh, you know, to adopt or create new evaluation tools and then um, you know, educate the faculty. The other thing that's interesting, you know, I said at the beginning of the talk how the ACGME in, the, in you know, 2000, 1999 launched the six competencies. And then the six competencies, you know, have leaked and, and been adopted by undergraduate medical education and maintenance certification. The same thing is happening with this whole milestone approach. So now medical schools are adopting milestones in, in the way they organize their curriculum and think about assessing students. And I think that, you know, again, maintenance of certification is also going to probably involve sort of some sort of milestone framework. So uh, it's an important, uh, important uh, construct. I think, in, I think in the end, you know. Um, I don't know why I had this cartoon there, but uh, uh, in the end, you know, the essence of training is all about you know, supervised clinical experience, and that's how doctors really learn. That's you know, hands-on clinical experience with supervision, feedback, and input, you know, from from more experienced providers. And I and hopefully these tools enhance that process. Uh, and certainly, it's an, an accreditation requirement. Um, I want to show. I, I probably got logged out. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of. Uh, now this is uh, examples of some of the new evaluation tools we've come up with. And again, our approach is to use um, uh, use the sort of the generic and trustable activity language. So this is the uh, the, the the EPA. I know this this alphabet soup is confusing, and, and this is in your hands. So the EPA. 
that the internal medicine community, internists are overachievers and detail oriented. That's why there's 142 curriculum milestones. And then it wasn't enough to have curriculum milestones, reporting milestones. They had to come up with EPAs, uh, these, the, you know, this, uh, this new language. So, so the EPA is managed the care of patients with acute common diseases across multiple care settings. So they say that's, a, that's something, a competency that all trainees should, should achieve at the end of 36 months of training. And so, um, and then for, for the Hellerstein rotation, under that includes um, organizing tests, tracking information, completion of clinical duties, appropriate clinical decisions. And then we came up with some Hellerstein content specific curricular milestones. So, um, make appropriate, uh, I'm sorry, manage patients with arrhythmia, including AFib, VT, and bradyarrhythmias, manage patients with chest pain, manage patients with decompensated heart failure, manage patients with valvular disorders. Um, and so, and, and for the faculty, the way these are organized is that if you, th you can get this on the five point scale, if you think um, a resident is competent in all of these, when you fill out the evaluation, if you put a three, it populates the three down in the rest of these curricular milestones. Or you can say, you can, you can put that they're competent and then go back and edit one or two, developing competency. So hopefully it'll make it less, less clicks and less burdensome for doing these evaluations because we need a lot of data points for, for our milestone reporting. Um, and then uh, this is again the Hellerstein example. Um, uh, you know, recognize indications of ACS therapy, recognize indications of anticoagulation, patient atrial fibrillation. Again, right, you know, we developed these with, with Brandy Atkins and other, other cardiology faculty. And then there's um, you know, other areas of evaluation, enhance patient safety, demonstrate professional behavior. Um, I think there's one more I was going to show. Uh, I don't know where it is. Um, there, we have this whole um, we have a whole suite of evaluations that we're working on. Um, well, log me out. So that's that 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 that's okay. You, you get the idea. So um, uh, we're going to be rolling out. We're almost done with all, designing uh, all the all the inpatient evaluation tools based upon this approach. Um, and then we're working on you know the clinic, the COE, and you know continuity kind of clinic evaluations. Um, so so faculty and residents will be seeing these. We've rolled out some. So. I think I'll stop there and invite Lisa to come up and, and uh, time for discussion. So, Thanks very much, uh, Keith and Lisa. It's uh, uh, breathtaking. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, yeah, I, I want to start the question by simply asking who at the ACGME is going to evaluate this no. information at a programmatic and even an individual level and how will they utilize it to yeah. accredit or it's crazy de accredit yeah. programs that, that's a great see it all starts with a great idea the great idea is let's stop focusing on process yes let's look at outcomes that's a great Super. idea well how do you implement that so so you know it, so that's what they've come up with and I, I guess the you know I, I talked a little bit in the beginning to talk about what's called the RRC the Residency Review Committee. Each discipline has an RRC. And for people involved in education or academic medicine or, or leadership, you know, getting on the RRC used to be sort of a, a feather. It's a hell of a lot of work for no compensation. Yes. So because each RRC is going to have to probably get all this data, you know, for each program and, and have have some way of sifting through it. But it, it is, it, it is that I think the ACG went into this kind of not knowing exactly what they're going to do and kind of feeling their way, so we'll see. Okay. But right now we have to report 22 milestones every six months for every 20. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, other questions or comments? Yeah. Dr. Bokar. So the old system seemed focused on accreditation of the program. This system seems focused on accreditation of the competence of the individual training. Right. So how does... Well, there's still, I, I showed it one of the early slides, in terms of the accreditation system, there's still the annual survey of the trainees, there's an annual survey of core faculty, and there's an annual report that we have, to, that we're just finishing out in Toronto Medicine, it's actually due tomorrow, we finished it a couple weeks ago. Um, so there's still other elements, but, but then they'll look at this, and I guess they'll probably sit back and first and say, okay, are they, are they reporting, and how are they reporting, and then, if, you know, if a program reports 
everybody you know, incompetent, then that'll get their attention. And our program reports, every, everybody from the very beginning is super competent. So I guess our strategy is to make sure we have the appropriate spread <laughs> over the 36 <laughs> months of training so as not to attract unwanted attention. Uh, so. Other com comments? Yes. Data to not well, honestly, I think that... Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the idea really is to is to you know graduate trainees who at the at the end of their graduation we feel confident and comfortable saying they can they can practice independently without any supervision, and and that's always been our responsibility. And in theory, this is going to give us more robust data to inform that decision. So actually, to, to just uh, put a little bit of uh, additional information on that question, there was a time. Uh, during the evolution of this where uh, the process was going to be, um, you know, it may take a given house officer five minutes to become uh, competency-based and there would be somebody who would take six years and that was a major uh, nightmare for program directors for institutions and thankfully uh, I think that's, yeah. that concept has gone by the wayside. You either, you know, go from uh, first year to second year or third year or right. not. Yeah, see, we all know there's there's PGY1s who after eight months could be a ward resident. You know, and, and, and occasionally there's people who need 14 months of, of that sort of training. So this this sort of the arbitrary 12 months, it's, it, it, so there was a movement afoot to say measure competency each rotation and then they, they, then they hit like a threshold, ding, 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 they're now a resident. Right. And it, it be, it, there's no way you could run a training program with an organized schedule and, and run a teaching hospital with, you know, with that sort of chaos. So, um, so if you think this is bad, yeah. imagine what might have been. Yeah. Yes, uh, Usha. I was just going to say, I think it, it, uh, the evaluations are just going to be so much more accurate because now you have certain people who always grade people from mm -hmm. a 7 to a 9, and then mm -hmm. other people just always go from like 4 through 6. But this is just, you know, it, it's just much more focused on what the actual skill right. is. And so right. it's. I think we've had, we've had a good process for doing the evaluations because we, we've been working on them and then vetting them with each other. So, you know, Simi Singh, Wanda Mirage, Terry LaPresta, Brandy Atkins, Lisa, myself, um, Carl. And, and so I've been writing them and they've been criticizing them and editing them. So I think they're actually going to be better vetted and more carefully thought out evaluations for the future. So, um, and uh, like Kalani? Um, so we're kind of getting ready to go into the recruitment season and I'm just trying to think in terms of extrapolating down the line as they have all this data that's now outcomes based rather than process based. Um, as you mentioned, how do you think that will affect if this stays on, you know, in terms of if I'm an applicant looking at programs and I go to the ACGME website and these are yeah. publicly reportable data on the 22 milestones, that's going to affect recruitment yeah. down the line for some programs I can imagine. That's a great question. You know, it's funny because part of the recruiting spiel used to be, you know, among other things, was, oh, we have a five-year cycle, we're in good shape. Right. Damn it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, on that note, I want to thank uh, Lisa and Keith, and we look forward to uh, the next two decades of Keith's leadership. Yeah. And <laughs> may, may he eclipse Marshall Wolf. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>